Things were simpler in the 70s. Your furniture was brown, your curtains were brown, and your carpet was probably brown as well. Cars were simple too. If your dad didn't have a Ford, then he had a Vauxhall. Bikes, just as simple. You had a 50cc moped when you were 16, and at 17, you stepped up to a 250. Now your moped was probably a fizzy, a Yamaha FS1e, and your 250, that was simple as well, because you had one of these three. I cannot tell you how excited I was in the run-up to my 17th birthday. I'd had a KH250 sitting in the garage for six months prior and I just could not wait. The 50 had given me a sense of freedom and a, and a kind of taste of rebellion that the quarter litre promised the whole Easy Rider experience. It felt like the whole world was now your oyster and even the magic tonne was now attainable. In the early 70s, Kawasaki's mission was to build the fastest bikes possible and the H1500 from 1969 was a proper rocket ship. The S1 was a scaled down version, 250cc with three carburettors feeding three cylinders giving it a lovely creamy turbine like feel. The best bit though was a gorgeous and very distinctive exhaust and induction howl. This Yamaha has race ancestry going back to the 1957 YD250 racer. And with the whole RD range being developed for the road from over a decade of successful competition history, Yamaha were onto a winner. <laughs> The result feels light and nimble, and yet solid and secure. And it's fast and lively, but it feels incredibly civilised and everyday usable. The engine is an absolute gem, and much of its flexibility between screaming power and useful torque can be credited to its mysterious torque induction, basically a reed valve in the induction port, and this soon became the two-stroke norm. GT250 production spanned virtually the entire decade, but remarkably, it remained pretty much untouched throughout that time. That didn't stop it, however, becoming the best-selling motorcycle. Suzuki were the first to introduce a disc brake as early as 1972 and for this particular model in 1973 they unleashed their secret weapon, Ram Air. What sounded as exciting to a teenager as getting to third base was actually nothing more than a bit of extra alloy bolted to the cylinder heads. The theory was that at speed 
air would be forced faster past the cylinder head cooling fins, increased in cooling and, well, nothing really. In practice, it did more in terms of selling the bike than it did in propelling it any better down the road. And it was widely known that you could actually bin the covers without making a jot of difference to anything. It's a great machine though, and still a lot of fun to ride. So the thing is, which one do you choose? Well the KH was exotic with its three cylinder engine, stylish tailpiece and a noise to die for. I think this was the edgy alternative. The RD is just a fabulous machine in all respects. It feels so crisp and so modern. It's light, nimble, and easily the quickest. So what about the GT then? It's not the best bike in any respect, and it certainly isn't quirky like the Kawasaki. What did Suzuki have to sell so many machines and build such a strong band of cult followers? Well, I think it was down to BS. Yep, Barry Sheen is what they had. If you had a Suzuki GT, you were Barry Sheen. 